So I'm here in Redmond uh, with Klaus Jorgensen. Klaus Jorgensen is Principal Program Manager in the High Availability and high Storage availability and storage Team. Yes, I always get it wrong. Yeah. And uh, Klaus is responsible for the storage spaces direct stuff. That's really great. And we did already an interview, I think, one year ago. Yeah. And there is new stuff coming in Storage Spaces Direct. So, yeah. Klaus, please tell us what is there, what is new? Well, so not too long ago we released Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 5, mm -hmm. and there was a bunch of, of enhancements in that one. So the first one I want to talk about is that we did a lot of work around simplification in terms of deploying it. So we, we rolled a lot of it up into the enable-cluster-s2d command. Mm -hmm. So the, what the command you use to do that is enable-cluster-s2d. So before, all we really did was turning the feature on, and then you, you have to go and create your storage pool and create storage tiers, et cetera. With, with Technical Preview 5, we actually rolled a lot of that work into enable cluster s 2 d mm -hmm. So what it does is that once you run that command, it goes and looks at the storage system you have, says, oh, I got some SSDs, I got some HDDs, what bus do I have, are they NVMe devices, or are they SATA devices, et cetera. And then we automatically de de determine which devices we'll use from our cache, which we'll talk about in mm -hmm. a minute. And then what are we going to do with the rest of the devices and make sure that they all get put into a storage pool and then define the storage tiers depending on the size and, and, the, and the things in the cluster. So that what that really comes down to is you run this command and then the next level or the next thing you want to do after that is create the volumes that you want to use for, to store your VMs. Mm -hmm. So behind the file shares that you want to create if it's a scale of file server. So it's now actually it's three things you have to do. You have to, or maybe four, you have to test the cluster, mm -hmm. then you have to create the cluster, then yeah. the enable cluster S2D, it's doing all the magic, and then yeah. you have to create your volumes you use for your storage, right? Exactly. And before that it was some steps and uh, you have to decide how to put the things. But you can still do that if you want to, right? Yes, you can override the automatic configuration. If you want to, for example, create a system with two or more storage pools, mm -hmm. you can do that. But that means you have to turn off the automatic configuration, which you do by just basically there is a flag called dash auto config. And mm -hmm. if you set that to false, then we say, OK, now it's all yours. Have fun. You can go do whatever you want. Okay, and that also means you have to live with what you did. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you will talk uh, about uh, some things where you maybe have to do that because the system can't configure out what you really want or there are yeah, different so options how you can use it, right? So technical Preview 5, we focused on the main scenarios like yeah. where I got SSDs and HDDs. Well, we actually focused mostly on hardware, device, uh, hardware scenarios. Yeah. If you want to stand up store spaces direct inside of VMs, because VMs don't are not exactly presenting hard drives the way a reg regular hard drive would be, you have to do some workarounds currently. We're actually looking at also including uh, VM deployments in our automatic configuration so those get set up uh, oh. as well. Okay, that's cool. So you also see uh, Storage Spaces Direct uh, in virtual environments, uh, not only on hardware. Like, would it be possible in Azure, for example? Yeah, I actually did push out a blog post just recently yeah, right. about standing up Storage Spaces Direct to support a scale of file server using just Azure VMs. And that blog post will be, like, shorter next time I'll write it. <laughs> because it becomes simpler, but oh. that's evolution, right? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so you can do it for dev test purposes mainly. Yeah. Um, and not everyone has the nice four node deployment you need for, for the storage space direct. By the way, wasn't there another feature that you maybe don't need yeah. four nodes anymore? Yeah, so we, we did some additional testing and starting with technical preview five, will support standing up uh, three node configurations. Okay. Yeah. So the thing about three node configurations, it, it, it lowers the barrier to entry, if you will. You got to have less servers. Um, the, the thing to bear in mind, though, is that with three nodes, we can only do, well, can, you have to use mirror configurations yeah. because in order to get um, erasure coded or parity, as we call it when in the PowerShell commands, uh, you have to have at least four machines. But with three, no with three nodes, you can do a three-copy or two-copy mirror. 
Oh, the two copies also an option. I usually go with three copies. That's the safest path, right? Yeah. Because with three copies, you can you can tolerate a server going down and losing another disk, etc. Yeah. Because then you still have at least one copy of your data left. But a a, a two mirror thing would also be. Uh, Okay, would be supported if I have a virt virtual disk that had only uh, two copies of the of the data. Yeah, I mean you just have to know what you're walking into, right? With yeah. two copies, that means that if you have a three-node cluster, then if you if you lose both copies, meaning it could be a disk in one machine, and yeah. then you do you want to go through a servicing scenario, well, then you may have lost both copies of your data, yeah. and then it's like okay, then it's off. It doesn't go away; it just means that it's offline. Okay, cool. What other features uh, do you have in TP5 that are um, cool? All is cool, of course. All is cool, <laughs> all is cool, all is cool. Well, so I want to take a minute to talk about uh, the cache that we built mm -hmm. because um, it is important to understand. So if you take a look at a system, so a classic system has uh, some hard drive. That's probably the most common one. We've got some hard drives. I'm just going to draw a single server here. Yeah. And then I got some SSDs inside a single server, mm -hmm. right? So we use the fastest possible media. So in this case, is uh, these the SSD, SSDs, yeah. yeah, right? If I have all flash and some of them are NVMe and some of them are SATA, then we're going to use the NVMe devices because NVMe is much more performant than SATA SSDs. But in a situation like this, I got some flash and I got some HDDs. Mm -hmm. These we call capacity devices. Capacity. And these we call caching devices, right? So what happens during the creation of the system is we essentially do a, a runtime binding of these HDDs to SSDs. That means that these devices act as a cache for these mm -hmm. machines, uh, for these uh, devices. So when you are writing data or you're reading data, this gets in the way. Or, well, not gets in the way. It actually accelerates the performance yeah. of these, right? It's good that it's getting in the way. It's good as it gets yeah. in the way, yes. So if I write some data, it'll go and land here, yeah. uh, land my data, and then when needed, we then write the data out to the actual hard drives. Okay. And similarly, when you read data, it goes into the cache here so that if it gets read later again, it can become. It can come. The read can come from here, from and it goes straight device. back from the from the faster device. Yes, okay. that accelerates performance a great deal. And I have this, to. I have to ask you a question here because this are uh, this is a cache, but there is not a mirroring taking place. Or I, some of these uh, devices can fail. Yes, these are the capacity devices, and that's the the. the two-way, three-way mirror or the parity uh, over uh, different systems, right? That's right. So it's important to understand how this works. So the, be the, the easiest way to say this is that the cache is machine scoped mm -hmm. and is independent of the storage pool and virtual disk configuration mm -hmm. in the system. So what that means is that the cache functions on the devices that are in this machine only, so there is no cache that needs to be failed over, et cetera. Yeah. Right, the virtual disk that gets created across the entire system is ensuring that there are data written to other nodes in the system. Okay. Right. So I don't have to have the cache mirrored in and of itself because that already happened at a higher level in the system. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. The other piece is that because the cache devices here are not part of the actual pool or part of the actual virtual disk. That means I'm not allocating my flash to a specific pool or to a specific virtual disk, which means it'll accelerate the I.O. to whatever pool, to whatever virtual disk is consuming it in the mm -hmm. system. Give you an example. If I have five virtual disks in the system, and it just so happened that one is really hot and the other four was created, but there is not a whole bunch of activity going on, well, guess what? These devices will mostly cache the stuff that goes on in the fifth virtual okay. disk that's the hottest. Okay, cool. That's the, that's the, that's the cool thing about basically uh, deconstructing the cache separate from the storage pool and, and the virtual disks. Okay. So now I have my capacity in these devices, right? Yep. Here's also something newer. In, in the capacity devices. Uh, this is the design I can do with uh, TP3, for example. But in TP4 and in TP5, you can do something here, right? Yes. So we 
we, um, we actually did uh, end up doing two things. So let me uh, change the drawings a little bit. Yeah. Actually, I'm a easier to start over. Is I can have, again, I can have my cache device, but in this case, we're going to treat them as NVMe devices. Yeah. Now, I can actually have a combination of additional flash devices and traditional rotating media down here, four of each, for example. Okay. Right? So let's say I have some high-performing NVMe devices, then they will be the caching device. Mm -hmm. But now I have some lower-performing SATA SSDs as well as some SATA HDDs. Mm -hmm. So we can actually construct a system out of all these three tiers of physical storage. So these will be cache and these will be capacity. So then you can ask, hey, wait a minute, how do I actually then manage this? Because they're not equal. Yeah. Right? So that is a so how I actually manage this. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> so the storage tiering that we configure in the system is that we have a new concept called multi-resilient volumes, or MRV. Yeah. So uh, it basically is a volume that consists partially of mirror and partially of parity inside okay. the same volume. Okay. Right. The idea behind this is that. This is the hot data, and this is the cold data. And what's the difference between mirror and parity? Well, the big difference is that mirror is the fastest way of writing data in a resilient way, okay. right? Because all I need to go do is just have to have the write land on my media. There is no calculation I need yeah. to do on top of the data. I just need to land three copies somewhere. The downside of mirroring is that it's relatively capacity inefficient. Because I have to land three copies, that means yeah. I'm only 33% efficient. Yeah. Parity, on the other hand, is very efficient because I can now uh, just do parity across a large set of data. The downside of it is that it's not very efficient when you write. Because when you write data, especially if you change existing data, you have to actually go read all the existing data, modify the data, and, write. and then recalculate your parity and then write again, okay. also known as the read, modify, write. Right? So when you write over here, you go through the read, modify, write. Here you just go through write. Yeah. So this is a lot more efficient in writing, and this is a lot more storage efficient. Yeah. Because you get a, a better usage than 33%, but I, I assume it depends on how many parity devices you have. Yeah, so this, well, so this one is 33% by definition. Yeah. This one is 50 plus percent. So the worst case is we got 50% storage efficiency, yeah. and then it just grows with the dimensions of the cluster. Okay, um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, how how uh, big your cluster can grow and how how much your efficiency is. But there is something else uh, because you said I write all the data to the mirror tier, right? Mm -hmm. How do how do you do that? Well, so this is in combination. So this is the multi-resilient volume, yeah, which works and requires and works only with REFS. So you put the REFS file system on top. Yeah. And then REF under REFS understands which piece of the volume is mirror and which piece is parity. Mm -hmm. So when data gets written to the file system, the REFS file system is going to write it into the mirror portion. Mm -hmm. right? And then as the mirror portion fills up with data, we're going to live analyze which piece is the hottest and which piece is the coldest. So as we get towards the size of the mirror, we're going to take the coldest piece, let's say it's this, and we're going to move that over to the parity. Right? Okay. Now, in this case, we actually move it over, and it's at that point we actually do the erasure code or parity calculation, which is a little more CPU intensive, but we only do it on data that we expect to be cold. Okay. Right, so we move it over here, and then we fill this up over time with the cold data. Okay. If you subsequently read the cold data, there is no penalty, in no CPU overhead yeah. or anything like that. You just read it out of the parity. But if you subsequently f rarely go in and actually want to write a piece of there, yeah, that would be slow. So. That would be that would have been slow. But the way the system works is we actually go write it over here, yeah. and then we just in metadata say that this data is no longer valid. So the write will complete quickly, and then behind the scenes we just go say, hey, this, this update we did over here now invalidates that data, which will basically free up the space. 
Okay, that's cool. And I still have the caching devices in front of this. So every every data is going through the cache mm -hmm. and then to the SSDs. Yes. Uh, so this, this you can consider a logical way of controlling the right behavior in the system mm -hmm. regardless of what the physical layout is. Okay. This is a logical way. So this is about this is about making right perform the best possible way we can while retaining the the parity or the storage efficiency in the system. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is then if you combine these two where you have these three different device types, what you can then do is you can then map these mirror and parity onto these two device types. So you could say, hey, I want all my mirror, once it gets out of the cache and onto the capacity yeah. device, I want it to land specifically on my SSDs, mm -hmm. and I want my parity to land specifically on HDDs, because that's the data, that's the, you know, the seven gigabyte of Windows Server that you never read again, but it's part of the base image yeah. that you get stored a couple of times over when you have VMs running. That'll eventually migrate out to the HDDs yeah. and will probably never be seen again, right? Well, yeah. It'll be seen, but not accessed. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned before there is a three-node deployment, and there we don't have the parity. So Correct. to do the multi uh, multi-resilient uh, um, uh, tier or the multi-resilient virtual disk, we need at least four, yes. um, four storage spaces direct nodes. Right. How, how large can it grow or how many nodes can I put together as, as one of those uh, storage spaces direct deployments? You could, for now, it's up to 16 nodes in a single system. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So and then uh, uh, I can do that, and then of course you said 50% plus. This will increase because I have a lot of more parity devices. Yes. Okay. Another question would be if I have 60 nodes. Um, um, normally only one node can fail, right? But you you did something there in TP5, right? Yeah. So we actually did. Um, this is about the local reconstruction codes algorithm. So local reconstruction codes is a variance of erasure coding that is uh, as a Microsoft intellectual property that we use in both Azure as well as Storage Spaces Direct. Mm -hmm. What it does, it controls the way we lay out the data symbols across systems. And what we've done in Technical Preview 5 is laid it out in a way so that it is by default optimized towards uh, two node uh, fault tolerance. Okay. Just like the three copy mirror. So we basically aligned because we have this combination, three copy mirror can be tolerant to two node failure, yeah. and we align the parity to be tolerant to also two node failure. So it becomes a lot simpler to to, okay. to understand this. So how many nodes do I need to that I can tolerate uh, a two two node uh, two node failure? So two node failure you can do with four nodes. With four nodes, I can. With four nodes, yes. That's very cool. Yes. So uh, can I do actually something like sites then? Uh, so if I uh, sites is not maybe uh, maybe the right thing because sites I have different uh, data centers and storage spaces direct is not designed for different data That's centers. Correct. Okay, but uh, cool. So have you? What you can do is with TP5 you can stand up a storage spaces direct cluster in one site yeah. and another storage spaces direct cluster in a second site, yeah. and then you can use storage replica, storage to, replica, replica to replicate the data. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I think uh, it's. I think that's a lot in TP5. Uh, we didn't forget anything, or? No, I think we got it all. Very cool, and I, I'm really looking forward to RTM. It, it will be this year, so uh, we, maybe we talk again about the stuff at Ignite or so. Yeah, anytime. Thank you, Klaus. Thanks.